Good afternoon, and welcome again to the Stoner Report. <coughs> I'm Marius Stoner, Associate Editor of Cannabis Culture Magazine, broadcasting live from the BCMP Vapor Lounge in Vancouver, British Columbia. Hope you're doing well this weekend. Um, the big news today is, of course, uh, the death of Nelson Mandela. Um, it was quite an influential man in the world, uh, perhaps uh, an example of what we all want to uh, become like. I uh, was fortunate enough to see uh, a movie based on his autobiography last night. Um, it was called Mandela, uh, Road to Freedom. Um, and uh, it was very moving and how he lost uh, half of his life in jail and yet um, retained his in integrity and uh, despite his desire for revenge realized that uh, nonviolence was the only way to uh, solve the problems in South Africa. So that's all in the news today. Um, it's not exactly hemp related but I thought I'd just mention that because uh, yeah <laughs> for obvious reasons. Anyways, thank you for joining me. Um, let me just check. Uh, how are you guys in chat? Good to see you there. Going to check my mixer. If the sound seems a little bit low, let me just change that. If that's any better, hopefully. No, it doesn't seem to be. Sorry about that. I tried to check things beforehand. I'm a little bit behind today. There, how's that? Nope, still nothing. I wonder what's wrong. There, okay. I think, uh, turn it up a bit more than usual, but it seems to be getting a better level. So sorry about that, everyone. And uh, on with the news. That to the side. Internationally. Okay. A leaked paper reveals the United Nations split over the war on drugs. Major international divisions over the global war on drugs have been revealed in a leaked draft of a UN document setting out the organization's long-term strategy for combating illicit narcotics. The draft written in September and seen by the observer shows that they are serious and entrenched divisions over the long-standing U.S.-led policy of promoting prohibition as an exclusive solution to the problem. Instead, a number of countries are pushing for the war on drugs to be seen in a different light, which places greater emphasis on treating drug consumption a, as a public health problem rather than a criminal justice matter. It is rare for such a document to leak. Normally, only a final agreed version is published once all differences between UN member states have been removed. Well, okay, that's a good sign um, that there's uh, uh, mostly uh, Central American and Latin American governments who do n are trying to push to stop the war on drugs, but it doesn't look like uh, things, things like that are going to happen very soon, at least not until the U.S. changes its policy considerably. In Canada, a class action suit would challenge the new medi medical marijuana laws. A proposed national class action suit has been filed in federal court against Health Canada seeking to have proposed changes to the medical marijuana laws declared unconstitutional. Four representative plaintiffs, Neil Allard, Tanya Beamish, David Herbert, and a person identified only as JM, all from BC, commenced litigation Friday in Vancouver. Allard has been medically retired since 1999. Beamish is an unemployed woman on a disability pension whose common law husband Herbert grows her cannabis, and JM is described only as an unemployed pers per person on a permanent disability since 1979. They are seeking relief from the court on behalf of between 35,000 and 40,000 Canadians who have a permanent ex exempting them from the criminal code prohibitions against 
possession, and production of pot under the Medical Marijuana Access Program established in 2001. The statement of claim, Lawyer John Conroy says, says the vast majority grow their own, but that 4,250 of those patients rely upon someone else to grow their medication. Roughly 6,000, he said, are buying marijuana from pr Prairie Plant Systems, the sole government-approved supplier under the present law, present system. So the, the new, the new uh, laws would force people to buy from Prairie Plant System or some other government-sanctioned uh, uh, distributor, uh, but, and that would increase increase the prices, the prices phenomenally. Uh, among other complaints that uh, many medical marijuana patients have. Bit of a strange. Uh, two stories from Denver how they almost uh, banned pot smoking in public view, but later changed it. Uh, this is the story before they made the vote. Uh, Denver poised to become the first world's, the world's unofficial marijuana capital when legal sales began begin in January 1st, but don't expect to see it smoked openly on front yards, porches, or bal balconies if the city council has its way. The Denver Council on Monday is expected to take final votes to approve a measure banning pot smoking on private property if the activity is visible from a street or sidewalk. So a 7 to 5 vote, the Council gave initial approval to the amendment. And uh, I won't read the entire article since it did not happen. I'll go over to the next one. Because in reversal, the pot porch ban is rejected. A lot of strange things happening in Denver. Uh, there's that ordinance in which uh, police go go out and uh, take their nasal ranger. They put it on their nose and check to see if there's too much pot smoke emanating from your house. And uh, now this craziness. Fortunately, this one is uh, got repealed. Good and frankly, somewhat surprising news from. De for Denver tokers. The city council last night reversed itself and undid the ban on marijuana smoking in public view, e even if on one's own property. There will be one more vote on the ordinance next week. According to KUSA-TV, Councilwoman Su Susan Shepard offered up an amendment to undo the ban, which passed last week on a 7-5 to five vote. The vote last night to reverse was 7-6. to six. Shepard suggested that rather than calling the police, neighbors try being neighborly. That would mean talking to your neighbor if his marijuana smoke bothers you, or dealing with your neighbor's concern if your mar marijuana smoke bothers him. That sounds reasonable, and uh, absolutely nothing to do with, with the law. <laughs> so that's pretty funny. Glad uh, things are uh, a little bit n normal, but uh, we're, we're bound to see a lot of crazy stuff happening, especially uh, in the first, which is less than a month away crazy how fast time flies how can we keep weed green massive marijuana warehouses are a massive energy suck when recreational marijuana use becomes legal in Colorado on January 1st medical retailers expect demand to increase by 400% Increasing s supply to meet that demand will carry with it dramatic economic and environmental costs. The monthly energy bill for River Rock, a medical marijuana retailer with two dispensaries and warehouse in the Denver area, exceeds 21000 According to John Koser, one of the River Rock's owners, that's nothing. One of his competitors pays a monthly bill of $100,000 for its warehouse operation. In Colorado and elsewhere in the U.S., the pot industry generates more than enough revenue to pay its bills. The environmental cost of doing business, though, is a different matter. In 2011, a study by researcher Evan Mills at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory showed indoor marijuana production accounting for 1% of the national electricity production, using $6 billion worth of energy per year and creating greenhouse gas pollution equivalent to of 3 million cars. 
Faced with rapid growth in those numbers, the city of Boulder put into place the kind of environmental regulation ordinarily associated with corporate polluters. Boulder requires marijuana growers to purchase wind or solar energy or to buy carbon offsets. That increases marijuana growing costs by an estimated 20%. River Rock's new 18,000 square foot greenhouse will primarily lose solar power rather than artificial lights. So yeah, I guess uh, it takes a lot of energy to grow pot indoors. And uh, well, uh, it would be awful to uh, destroy the environment while, while doing it. Of course, when it's legal everywhere, it can be grown uh, outdoors as well. And that I don't think is quite as damaging. A lot of stuff from Colorado this week. Colorado medical marijuana business application backlog persists. Dozens of businesses continue to operate without full Colorado state licenses. Nearly a hundred Colorado medical marijuana businesses are operating without finalized state license. The remnants of a bureaucratic backlog now stretching back more than three years. In the language of state marijuana enforcement division, these businesses are operationally pending. What that means is the businesses are allowed to remain open, growing and selling marijuana, while the state conducts its investigation and decides whether to approve or deny the applications business, businesses submitted in 2010. The state has made tr tremendous progress in clearing its backlog of pending applications. There were more than 900 of them a year ago and hopes to eliminate the bag clock this month. But the issue has gained new attention after major Drug Enforcement Administration raids last month on medical marijuana businesses in Colorado, including several operating under pending applications. Of the 96 pending applications for medical marijuana stores, cultivation facilities and makers of products listed in state records, at least a dozen are tied to addresses raided or people targeted in the raids. Okay, so that's uh, quite the dilemma. We still don't have any details. Uh, of the raids, of exactly what was what happened yet, at least none that I have seen. If if they are, uh, email them to me, Marius at CanvasCulture.com. Um, and the fact that this there's a backlog on the state is obviously going to, well, it might it might cause some problems, because uh, the promise was of course not to bother people that were operating under state, uh, uh, under sanction of under state regulations, but of course. Uh, at the same time, these businesses were uh, su supposed to be allowed to remain open while their uh, uh, licenses were pending anyway, so perhaps that isn't an issue. <laughs> Overseas, uh, Israel seeks to tighten its medical marijuana regulations. As you know, Israel is uh, being uh, one of the foremost uh, countries uh, promoting medical marijuana regulation. However, their uh, access regulations are, uh, well, it's not like the dispensaries we have uh, dealing BC, but in Vancouver, that's for sure. Israel's health ministry has expressed opposition to granting medical marijuana to granting general practitioners the right to prescribe medical marijuana. Instead, the ministry will certify 10 doctors during the first half of 2014, allowing them to prescribe medical marijuana to the growing number of patients who, certainly, who currently use it. These 10 newly certified doctors will join the 20 doctors currently permitted by the health ministry to prescribe the drug. A bill formulated by the health ministry will be brought before the cabinet for discussion next week. The bill also seeks to transform the current distribu distribution process, replacing local marijuana growers with a more regulated supply to pharmacies. Marijuana is defined as a dangerous drug, though at the same time, the health ministry recognizes that there are medical uses for medic marijuana. Even if it is not an official medication or remedy throughout the world, it can reduce the suffering of many patients, reads the introduction to the bill. The health ministry believes that marijuana should be treated like every other medical product. It requires proper supervision in order to safeguard public health. 
while also taking into consideration its special nature. Happy 2.20, everybody, and happy 4.20 in the central time zone. It requires, uh, let's see, given that marijuana is considered a dangerous drug, any arrangement made to regulate medicinal use of a plant in Israel must closely resemble the regulations for other narcotic medications, continues the bill. <coughs> well, that's kind of funny, isn't it? Uh, calling marijuana a dangerous drug, or even calling it a drug in some cases is not appropriate. You would have to say it's a plant that contains drugs, but anyways. Anyways, happy 220. I'm going to roll a joint and talk a bit about the Sensible BC campaign. Um, if you're in British Columbia and you have not signed the petition yet, please do so. Um, where are they? Hold on. I just find out where they are right now. Uh, in Vancouver, we actually we were telling people uh, that it ends on the fifth, but that's because it it ends on people have to mail their applications to the central office um, at 207 West Hastings, uh, apartment 814, by the fifth. But uh, we can still collect signatures. Uh, we have to get them in by Monday, the ninth. And uh, right now, the cannabis. I'm sure there's other canvassers out there. But right now the cannabis is at Main and Terminal. Uh, it will be there until 7 p.m. So if you have not signed, uh, or your friends haven't signed, or anything, just get down there, <laughs> sign that petition. Um, I don't know how close it is. Nobody seems to know right now. So much has come in the mail the last few days. Um, we're just going to keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, big kudos to everybody who took part in the campaign and collected any signatures or promoted it or just even uh, everybody who even signed it. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for taking part in democracy and uh, helping us uh, uh, make the world a greener place. <laughs> um, I also have, like, I have high hopes that uh, not only will this uh, help decriminalized cannabis in British Columbia, but I'm hoping that it will spur a uh, political movement in British Columbia. Like so many people have become activated as activists, um, <laughs> that uh, <coughs> uh, when when the time comes when the time comes for a provincial and even a federal election, um, these people will hopefully remain active and will uh, encourage other people to vote so that uh, we don't have such apathy in the polls and we don't end up with such uh, evil politicians who don't really care about the people but only about whoever pays them the most. Okay. Oh, I don't have a rolling paper. That's really terrible. Alyssa, can you grab me a rolling paper, please? And I just asked Alyssa for a rolling paper. Hopefully she heard me. If not, I'll have to leave camera and grab one. Or maybe not even smoke. No, I can't not do that. No, okay, I'm going to grab one. Be right back. <sighs> yeah, I've been really busy lately. I haven't bought rolling papers. So how's chat doing there? What are you guys smoking in chat? Anything exciting? <laughs> yeah, you can't you can't not smoke on a pot TV show. I mean you can. But it just it just wouldn't be right. Here, I'm even gonna forego the filter on this one. Let's just get her lit.
Maybe that's better. So happy 420. Thanks for uh, joining me and uh, keeping up with the pot news, celebrating your freedom. Uh, last week was my 10th show, so this is my 11th. Um, still getting started, still learning so much about what I'm doing and how to do it properly. But uh, I feel a little bit better about it now. And uh, I hope you guys are enjoying it too. Lots more news still to cover. Might, might be a little bit late today. Uh, in New Jersey. Chris Christie says no to a bill expanding a medical marijuana program. The latest bill to expanding the medical marijuana program is only days old, but Governor Chris Christie says he already knows he won't sign it. The bill would allow registered mer medical marijuana patients in New Jersey to buy the drug in another state while it's legal to bring it home. Six of the 19 states and Washington, D.C. that have medical marijuana programs have such reciprocity agreements by which they recognize patients outside their own state. Christie told reporters today he is not open to it and believes it's just a back door to legalize marijuana for everyone. See, this is what happens. Every time you sign one of the expansions, then the advocates will come back and ask for another one. The, the governor said during a press conference in his state house office this afternoon, here's what the advocates want. They want legalization of marijuana in New Jersey. It will not happen on my watch, ever. I am done expanding the medical marijuana program under any circumstances, so we're done. <sighs> Did he stick out his tongue after he said that? I mean, <laughs> there's no outpouring of people signing up for this program, Christie added. This is another one of those narrow groupthink policies put forward by a legislator, and I'm not going to continue to expand it because what they want is legalization. They're not getting legalization under this governor. Okay, well, there's a... Obviously, he's straw manning it, like saying, oh, this is what they want, but that's not actually what they're asking for. <sighs> so, yeah, what a... What a mature fellow that Chris Christie is. <sighs> not. In British Columbia, where more legal challenges happening, this time about edibles, medical marijuana in tea or baking faces another BC court challenge. The Crown is appealing a BC Supreme Court decision that allows patients authorized to use medical marijuana to drink it in tea or bake it in their brownies and cookies. On Friday, Owen Smith said the head baker for the Cannabis Buyers Club of Canada will be before the BC Court of Appeal in Vancouver trying to preserve his April 2012 constitutional victory against Health Canada's medical marijuana access regulations. At a press conference on Tuesday, Smith's lawyer, Kirk Tussaw, said he was excited to again demonstrate that the rights of medical marijuana patients to medicate themselves with cannabis and cannabis derivatives should be protected under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We're simply asking for the right to be able to ingest a safe and natural health product that's been used medicinally for thousands of years, Tussaw said. I think there's a long history of protecting access to health care in this country, and I hope we continue to stand on that Friday. Okay, well, the, I, I'm not a legal mind, but uh, the Crown appealing uh, a decision uh, to allow edibles? I mean, one of, one of, one of the only uh, caveats about taking medical marijuana is the fact that you're smoking it and thereby uh, hurting your lung tissue, uh, which is uh, not a factor when you're doing edibles. So you take the danger away and they want to ban it. I just do not understand it. That's just absolute insanity. And uh, thank you, The Crown, for wasting uh, all our hard-earned taxpayer money on this piece of shit appeal. I mean, <laughs> excuse my language. Oh, what? Absolute idiots. <laughs> but like Kirk Tusa, like, like he said, is uh, excited to, uh, to show how wrong they are. So um, be looking forward to that, at least. All right, in Missouri, 
a legalization initiative has been filed. Activists with Show Me Cannabis Reform have been crisscrossing Missouri to lay the groundwork for marijuana legalization, and now they've taken the next step. Columbia-based attorney Dan Vietz, a group's chairman, the group's chairman Wednesday, filed a series of initiatives that would legalize marijuana via a constitutional amendment. The initiatives are all variations on a theme. All would legalize ma marijuana for persons 21 and over, but vary on the number of plants allowed to be grown, where the convictions of previous offenders should be expunged, and how to regulate advertising. Show Me Cannabis Reform will do polling to see which has the most support among Missourians. The initiative petitions must be approved by the Secretary of State's office, and after that, the office has 10 days to approve draft ballot summary language. Even if approved, the initiative supporters face a daunting task. To qualify for the ballot, organiz organizers must collect the signatures of roughly 320,000 of registered voters by May 4th, and they must gadgester, uh, gather signatures from at least 8% of the registered voters in six of the state's eight U.S. constitutional districts. Okay, those, <laughs> those numbers are so similar to what we have in B.C. We have to gather 320,000 signatures. Um, but uh, ours is, uh, uh, we have to collect 10% of each of our writings. So uh, good for them. Looks like uh, a lot of people are trying to do the same things, uh, similar things that we're doing here in British Columbia. And it's good. It feels good <laughs> not to be alone. <laughs> Here's a story uh, by Anthony Papa from the Drug Policy Alliance. I turned down three years in prison and ended up with 15 to life. Today, a new report by the Human Rights Watch titled An Offer You Can't Refuse revealed that only 3% of U.S. drug defendants in federal court cases chose to go to trial instead of pleading guilty in 2012. The report explains that the reason only 3% go to trial is because prosecutors warn defendants that if they refuse the plea and go to trial, they will be charged with a more serious crime and end up with a much longer sentence. Prosecutors live and die for convictions, and they use mandatory minimum sentencing as a prosecutorial, prosecutorial tool to s secure convictions and get people to plead guilty without getting their right to a fair trial. People's fear of angering prosecutors by going to trial is real. The reports show that defendants who chose to exercise their constitutional rights to go to trial routinely face sentences three times greater than the original plea deals. This is an astounding revelation. I know the pressure to take a deal and the disastrous consequences of taking my case to trial. In 1985, I refused a plea deal of three years and ended up being sentenced to 15 years to life under mandatory provisions of New York's Rockefeller drug laws. I was duped into believing an envelope contained four ounces of cocaine for $500 by a bowling, $500 by a bowling buddy. During the criminal proceedings, the district attorney's office discovered I was not a drug dealer, but nevertheless, they wanted to secure a conviction. Anyways, you can read the rest of his story in the Drug Policy Alliance. And only 3% of people even go to trial. And... Uh, how many of those are innocent people who are just afraid of getting more time than the plea bargain? We probably will never know. Okay. And yeah, we're going a little bit over time, but uh, almost near the end. Just a couple of hemp stories. Hemp production sees steady growth in Canada. Canada's hemp growers grew a record large crop in 2013, and while acreage to the multi-use crop is still very small compared to most other options, further increases are expected next year. The longer-term outlook may s see it even compete with canola at some point in the future, from where one industry promoter sits. We had an excellent hemp crop this year, said Kim Shakula, or Shakla of the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance, based in Steinbeck, Manitoba. Canadian farmers grew a, a record 66,700 acres of hemp in 2013, which compares to about 54,000 
acres the previous year, according to Health Canada data. Yields were good, with no challenges reported during the growing periods, said Sh Shakla. Shukla. The biggest acreage increase was in Saskatchewan, where the bulk of Canada's hemp crop is grown, with Alberta and Manitoba seeing increases, she said. The economic return has been great for producers, she said, noting the acreage increases were the result of both new growers and existing producers expanding their acres. And we go again to Colorado for a story entitled Hemp Might Make a Comeback in America. Let's hope it does. The New York Times wrote Thursday about Colorado's marijuana refugees, families who uprooted their lives to the mo to m the move that uh, uprooted their lives to the m to move to the state where legalized pot because of drug crucial medicinal effects on their children's illnesses. Okay, I'm not sure if I read that sentence right, but you get what I mean. I put what fit in my car and drove out there. Marisa Kaiser, whose toddler Urza has had seizures almost since birth told the Times. No one could have predicted that the state's legislation would create a community in exile of more than a hundred families who help look after one another's children, trade medic medicinal tips, and even in some cases shared their first Thanksgiving dinner in this new land. Colorado's new law is reaping other changes too, among them the first legal crop of hemp that America has seen in nearly 60 years. Hemp is a cannabis plant, as is marijuana, but it contains almost none of the THC, the component that gives pot its potent effect. Still hemp, which can be used in products from rope to auto parts to plastics, shampoo to vitamin supplements, has paid for the stigma attached to its sister plant. Though it is legal to buy and sell hemp in, U in the U.S., growing and harvesting it has been prohibited. In every state that discusses legalization, hemp's economic potential comes up. Data from Canada's legal hemp industry suggests the crop yields revenue of 390 an acre, and the Hemp Industries Association estimates that products from the forgotten cannabis already constitute a 500 million industry in the U.S., according to the Denver Post. I think that once people see the value of hemp, it'll become a no-brainer, said farmer Ryan Laughlin, the Colorado man who has already planted 60 acres of the plant. All right, well, that is the Stoner Report for this week. Thank you again for joining me. If you're in Vancouver, uh, go down to Main and Terminal, sign the Sensible VC petition. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you can't do it today, try to sign over the weekend. Uh, go to the website, sensiblebc.ca. Uh, they, they will keep you posted on where the bus is or where you can sign. Um, rest in peace, Nelson La Mandela. Um, yeah, thank you for again for joining me. Remember, um, cannabis is the most advanced plant on the planet, and we can use it to save the planet, save ourselves. So, peace. Take care. See you next week. <laughs>